Hey guys, Matt Tabeek here. Another episode of Bird Noises presented by Bose, a podcast about the Atlanta Falcons and mostly everything else. Today we have an exciting guest joining us, Matt Miller, uh, formerly of Bleacher Report, which feels weird to say. He was there for, geez, at least a decade. And uh, he's got some new and exciting things he's doing now. We're going to talk about that and some of the changes he's got going on in his life and and lots of exciting things for all you draft picks out there. We're going to talk about Arthur Smith, the new head coach, and the new GM, Terry Fontenot, and get Matt's reaction to those new hires. We're going to talk, of course, free agency, the draft, mock drafts, Matt's latest, what he thinks the Falcons are going to do. And we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of his, his, his whiffs and his his other mock dress where he's nailed it and some give him a chance to talk up what he's doing. And then we're just going to end it with uh, what do you think the Falcons are ultimately going to do? Um, but Matt, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, no pressure, right? To, <laughs> to first appearance, let's talk about all the bad, all the bad predictions you've ever made in your career. So that will be fun. <laughs> I, I actually love that part of it. So that, that will definitely be fun. But I appreciate you guys making time for me like you said it's still weird for me for people to be you know to say matt miller you know for 10 years you've heard bleacher report after that and so it's still uh it's still weird for me to hear so i'm kind of listening to see how other people say it so that i can steal it so formerly <laughs> a bleacher report i think that works well now it's the uh the draft scout so um you know so many people you know lived and died by your uh your mock drafts and all your insight there and your your all the great content that you, cre you created there for a decade. Um, tell us about what the decision to, to leave and, 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 you know, what you're doing now and why you're doing it and why you're excited about it. I'm excited about it, but, you know, just tell us a little bit about what you've got going on. Yeah. I think, you know, one thing, it's kind of an inside baseball type thing, but you know, those of us who work at, you know, networks or big, big companies, we're under contracts a lot like players are. And so two years ago, I signed an extension. I was actually in Atlanta for the Super Bowl and, and signed an extension, a two-year deal, and said, oh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it two more years. I didn't really feel like I had done everything I needed to do at Bleacher Report or tried to build all the things I wanted to build there. So it's like, let's give it two more years and, and hopefully can accomplish some of those goals and, and maybe be positioned to either stay uh, or go do some other things. So about a year and a half in, I was like, Yeah, this I I just felt I'm going to be honest, Matt, I felt like I was able to get lazy in that role because mm. once you establish, like once your brand is established, right? Like mm -hmm. once people, once you have so many followers on Twitter or, you know, like you don't have to work as hard and that's, that's not me. And so I looked at the fact that I was writing one article a week. I was doing a couple podcasts a week. That's just not me. I want I to be writing job. every day. I want to be <laughs> right. It's not everybody listening is like, this guy's crazy, but you know, I, I made a name for myself in this industry by, by just working my tail off. And I looked around and was like, I, I felt like I had made it to the, the peak of the mountain there. And so I was just like, I'm only, I'm 37. Uh, I was 36 at the time that I made this decision and thought, man, I, I hope I still have a long time left in this industry. And I felt like to do that, I needed to diversify. I needed to get back to writing more often. I needed to be in charge of my own brand a little bit more. And Love be that. able to do the things that I want to do, you know, to podcast as often as I want to, to write as often as I wanted to, to do things like this with you guys. And so I have a, a ton of admiration for the people who started Bleacher Report, for the people who are running it still. But I, I really just felt like I had I'd done everything I could do there. And 10 years is a very long time in sports media to work somewhere. And it, sure so it was bittersweet. It was like a divorce, you know, of, and mm. it's still weird. You know, people still tag me in the stuff and like, you know, where's Matt at? Or, you know, they'll ask me where, what my co old coworkers are doing. It's like, guys, I don't know. I don't, we don't talk anymore. So it's, it's been, it's been weird, but uh, it's also been really energizing. It's been rejuvenating. It's, it's awesome nice to, to have to work hard. So it's been fun. That's awesome to hear. Yes. It, that is a long time to be at one place in this biz, but uh, you know, it, it, it does feel weird. I know when you, you had tweeted out hard to say, this is my last my last mock draft at Bleacher Report, and I'm going, <gasps> what's going on? What's happening? Right. I so, think a lot of people were, like, and you know, you know how contracts go. There's only so much you can talk about, and there's, you know, sure. deadline, you know, there's days where you can say things. And so I think a lot of people were like, I think a lot of people thought I was quitting, you know, like getting out of the business altogether. And I had to be like, wait, like, wait, I'm not, 
not going anywhere. I'm just, yeah. I'll just be, I'm not, well, I'm going somewhere different. I'm, I'm not jumping out of it. Yeah. I mean, I, just because, I mean, so many people uh, lived and died with your content, love your content. And uh, you know, I know I do, and I know a lot of people who do. And so, yeah, I guess there is that, but it's like, nah, Matt Miller's going to go somewhere. Someone's hiring him or something because it's Matt Miller. Um, well, but, I'm uh, glad you have that faith in me. It's been terrifying. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> Um, I'm sure it's going to be great and we'll get into all the cool things you're doing, but at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's all really good for football fans. It's all really good for people who, you know, this is like the season of hope, right? Yes. In, in a lot of yeah. ways, you're like Santa Claus, uh, because I'm not I'm seriously because yeah. everybody feels good about their team right now. And, and then, you know, free agency is right here, you know, six weeks away and then the draft and, you know, it's like Christmas. And then you've got guys like you saying, this is what your team's going to do. And this right. is how you're going to get better. This is what they need. It's like if there was a person who predicted what you were going to get for Christmas, you know, yes. or yes. little kids could go to their website and be like, what am I getting for Christmas? It, it is a lot <laughs> like that. And I think that, you know, the favorite part of my job, of course, like mock drafts drive this industry. My favorite part yeah. is being able to uh, talk to fans about who the players are because you know there there are a lot of diehard draft fans out there who know as much about the players as I do honestly but then there's a I think a larger collection that that don't you know they're casual fans or they're you know they might be a big college football fan but they don't look at those players through the prism of how do they project to the next level so my favorite part is you know really January 1 until May 1 when you get to talk to those Atlanta Falcons fans who, you know, maybe they don't watch a lot of football outside of the SEC and they want to know about the players who are a good fit at, at number four overall. And, and how can you, you know, get this team back into a Super Bowl? And so that's the fun part is starting to talk about those players that, that fans might not have heard of. And, and also there's, I mean, there's a huge section of NFL fans. This shocks me that don't watch a lot of college football. And so they, they started a clean slate and want to know, Hey, who are these guys? Who should we be looking at? Yeah, it starts right now for them, right? It used to be you'd buy the magazines, sport, and in all the draft guides and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And then you start kind of educating yourself on these guys, or they just go through the mocks, right? Well, you know, these are the these is what the experts are saying. These are the these are the 32 guys I need to 32, 42, whatever it is, you know, because most mocks are first round. Some now you're seeing, you know, full seven round mocks like that you're doing. And People, what one thing I want you to talk about here for a second is just, I don't think people realize the amount of time and research that you put into it. It's not like you're just watching some YouTube highlights here or, or you know what I mean? You're actually, you're, you're watching the games, you're taking notes, you're going to the senior bowl, you're going to bowl games, you're, yeah. you're watching the velocity of these guys on the sidelines, you're, you know, when they're throwing balls and you're, you're sizing them up and you're kind of watching their body language and, I mean, you know, all they have to do is just go to your YouTube channel or listen to your mic'd up or, and we'll get into all that stuff, but how, just talk about the process of just the amount of time you put into your mock drafts, for example. Yeah. I mean, it's a full-time job, I've, you know, is the biggest thing. And I really try to model what I do after how a team would do it. You know, that was, that was my dream growing up. I wanted to be, I wanted to be a general manager. You know, that was, that was, I was obsessed with it. So even as a, you know, a young child, I was, just, I wanted to learn how they did their job. And so I read every book I could find about, you know, Bill Walsh and Mike Holmgren. And then that becomes Bill Belichick and Sean Payton and, you know, the, the Ted Thompson and, or the Ron Wolf, excuse me, you know, dynasties that he's built. So just trying to learn how those guys do the job and then advance that, you know, through connections. Like you said, it's, this year was different because the oh, yeah. senior bowl was the only time I watched college football in person this year, but it is so much of, traveling every other weekend was pretty normal for me until the pandemic hit to watch players in person uh, also to interact with you know readers and listeners uh, but then you you know a huge part of this it is you know it's it's getting whether you know being on the road and having someone else drive for a couple hours so you can sit in the back seat with your ipad and a, a notepad i always have like a million of them beside me like I, right here there's always a couple and so that's a huge that's honestly the biggest part of my job is watching film on top of that in this industry, you have to have connections, I think, to hit a certain level of credibility. And so the other part of that is, you know, keeping up, building those relationships, making the connections and then keeping them going because they they truly are. A lot of times it's a friendship. Other times it's a, it, almost an information sharing type relationship. So you have to keep those uh, connections up. And as 
people change jobs. You got to keep track of that. You know, okay. You might have a guy who was, you, you know, you got a connection to the Falcons. They change everybody. Okay. Now that guy's maybe with the Browns. So you got to try to find a new in with the Falcons and, and it's, you're constantly trying to, you know, build that Rolodex basically. Then there's the, ha you know, multimedia side of it that you mentioned. It's writing, it's podcasting. I do a local radio show where we talk national sports for two hours a day, uh, trying to dip my toe into the YouTube waters a little bit more tweeting, Instagramming. It's, it truly is. And it's, it's awesome. It's the best job in the world. It is a lot of work and it all goes back to that, yeah. you know, that foundation of like, I will write 300 scouting reports by myself this year. And so watching film on 500 players, essentially because, you know, in the past I've sat at a desk on draft weekend and I, I don't know yet what it's going to look like this year for me that those three days in April, but uh, you know, normally I would be sitting there and if a player's picked, you have to be able to speak intelligently about them for 60 to 90 seconds. What do they do well? What do they not do well? Is there anything in the background we have to know? Is there anything injury related we have to know? Oh, and they've just been drafted by a team. How do they fit there? So it's, there's really a lot that goes into that so that you feel prepared to speak on anyone at any time, basically. Unbelievable. I believe it though. Uh, it, you know, and I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, I spend four and a half hours a week I'm starting to feel really bad about myself just putting my, together a one round mock. And, and basically <laughs> it's like, I'll watch a little bit here. I'll read a little bit here. I'll see, you know, I'm like, I, you know, there's like a plethora of different mock drafts that come out too. And I'm like, yeah, what is this guy thinking? You know what I mean? And so, and then you're trying to gauge, you know, what you know about the team and what they, what you think they really need. And compared to like, you know, the talking heads out there that are saying, you know, the Falcons are going to do X, Y, and Z. And, it's, it's really, really, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are listening to you right now going, Oh man, this sounds like a dream job. It is too. It really is. Don't let yeah. me, don't let how tired I look today. Uh, change the fact <laughs> it really, really is a dream job. Well, let's take all that knowledge. And you said you, you can speak uh, intelligently 60 to 90 seconds on prospects. Uh, let's tap into your brain, but first let's talk about the, the moves that the Falcons have made. You know, they've yeah. brought in Terry Fontenot who spent his entire career in new Orleans. And then Arthur Smith, who's been, you know, through a number of head coaching changes, but has been in Tennessee, two guys that have really kind of come up through those programs. And uh, what was your first reaction when you think of that pairing and you think of Arthur Smith and what he did like with, Ryan Tannehill in that offense and Derrick Henry became Derrick Henry. You know, we all know what he studied he was in, in Alabama, but then, and then you also mix that into that philosophy that Fontenot is going to bring, you know, being under Mickey Loomis and, you know, people like, you know, he's been influenced by Ozzie Newsome and that kind of thing. So your impressions and what you think of that marriage. Yeah, I think it's a home run. And I, I think this was kind of a controversial opinion. I actually thought Arthur Smith was the best head coaching candidate available in this cycle. And I know it's a little bit of a hot take because Eric Bieniemy is a great, great candidate. And I think Brian Gable is a really good candidate. Uh, I did not at the time know Urban Meyer was going to be available. So that, that changed things a little bit, did. but right. So of the people who were available, I thought, you know, like the, the things I've heard about Arthur Smith, the job he's done in Tennessee, the ability to build a versatile offense, you know, he's not beholden to one scheme, one type of personnel. We've seen that in Tennessee where they really changed things once Ryan Tannehill became the starting quarterback that I loved that about him. And, you know, knowing uh, enough people who know him, who speak so highly of what he's been able to accomplish at such a young age and the ability to coach every position on offense, I think is a huge part of it because too often we get guys who, okay, you're a quarterback coach, you're coach the quarterbacks and, but you can't coach the rest of the offense. And I think with Arthur, what you love about it is he's run and pass game. It's not, and not to, you know, speak ill of anyone else in the NFL who might be, you know, heavy on run or pass. I think that balance is super important for whomever uh, was going to hire him. I think in Atlanta, it works really, really well because you have a you know, established, uh, very good quarterback in Matt Ryan. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have pieces in the pass game where uh, if the run game could be improved through the offseason, you have to love the, the matchup there. As far as Terry Fontenot goes, yeah. I like this move for a couple of reasons. Number one, you heard a rival. So I love when you can do that, when you can take <laughs> a division rivals, like when you can take big brothers, one of their weapons, that's yeah. what you want to do uh, every chance you get. But I think also someone who not only has a pro and college scouting background, but somebody has a playing background as well, you know, going to college to Tulane. Yeah. Um, that is that I love that because I think too often with these GM hires in the past several years, 
teams have gotten a little bit cute. It's like, oh, let's hire a cap guy. Okay, well, who's going to scout for you? Or uh, let's hire someone from TV. Okay, well, like TV uh, and real scouting are very, very different. You do, you know, a lot of times you have a producer in here helping you out uh, when you're on TV. You don't have that when you're sitting in a war room. And so I think, in, you know, kind of ignoring some of the hype and some of the noise, they went and just grabbed somebody who knows how to evaluate and has been doing it, uh, like you said, under Mickey Loomis, you know, with connection to what they've built down there. You know, uh, Jeff Ireland being such a, a great right. scout as well. Like yep. you've learned from some of the best and, and throwing the, you know, the influence of Sean Payton and just seeing how they run their organization that has been so successful, you know, the last what, 15 years, uh, maybe a little bit more at this point. I, I think that's a huge part of it because you not only do you want someone who can scout, you want someone who can, you know, establish and maintain culture. And, you know, you guys have an owner uh, down there who's, who's been great at that. But I think now, you know, with, with Thomas Dimitrov there and, and what they had, you know, maybe it got a little bit stale. And so now you're injecting in some, a, what, a 40 year old general manager who yeah. is going to bring some excitement to the table. I, I think that's a very good thing. Well, I'm sure Falcons fans are going to love hearing that from you. Well, th those two men um, are, are going to have to make some tough decisions uh, coming up. Uh, you, every team has tough decisions when it comes to the cap, right? But you know, we, the, the Falcons have their challenges there and they've got some big contracts. There's been a ton of speculation, you know, about Matt Ryan's future and, you know, even Julio Jones and Arthur M. Blank, who you just referenced, uh, you know, yesterday said that he'd be shocked if they did anything with Matt. And, you know, just, I have said in the mailbag I do every morning, it's just, it, it makes no financial sense to, to, right. to move on from Matt. And Matt hasn't been the issue here, Matt has been playing at a really, really high level. Matt's been thrown. I think he's, you know, eclipsed 4,000 yards, 10 years now. It's, he's very productive and it, they've had some other issues, but it's so easy as you know, to just point the finger at, you know, the most important position on the team. Um, yeah. So, you know, just what are your general, just general thoughts there as, as the team kind of heads into free agency? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I think the all, my only thing with Matt Ryan would be he's, you know, he's getting a little bit older, but what does that even mean in the NFL anymore? You know, I mean, there's this guy in Tampa Bay who's 43 yeah. and still looks pretty good. I don't know Drew if I'm Brees. allowed to say his name anymore yeah. on this podcast, right? Uh, Drew Brees <laughs> playing for a long time. And so with Matt Ryan, it's like, okay, he's 35, but you play in the Southeast, number one. It's like weather's not a concern. You play in a dome, number two, which is gorgeous, by the way. And you have weapons and you have a team that's invested in the offensive line through uh, multiple first round draft picks. Yep. So I look at it and say, like, I'm with you. I don't think Matt Ryan is issue at all. And uh, I would I would be more prone to let's try to fix uh, what's around him instead of let's throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Yeah. And I think, you know, at number four overall, I know there's a lot of conversation about you don't expect to be drafting this high very often. So maybe yeah. you should get the quarterback of the future. And I think yeah. that is the only reason that, you know, when I'm doing a mock draft, that's the only reason I entertain a quarterback at four because the depth of this year's class, there's four really good ones. And the fact that, okay, let's, maybe this is a, you know, an Aaron Rodgers situation where you got a guy who's getting a little bit older. Let's we're in an odd position where there's value. Maybe you go ahead and draft the next guy, but, you know, if, if a quarterback's drafted at four, it's not because Matt Ryan's not a good quarterback. And if a quarterback's drafted at four, I, I would, you know, gather to say they're going to sit on the bench for a couple of years and try to learn. So I think that's the other side of this conversation in a class with three excellent wide receivers, one just dominant tight end prospect, two very good Thanks. offensive tackles. Yeah, I mean, it's would you rather support Matt Ryan for four years or draft, a, you know, a potential replacement who's going to ride the bench for a couple of years? And that, you know, they're having that conversation in Green Bay right now. If you trade up to get a guy <laughs> and then the quarterback you already had is going to win an MVP award, doesn't look that great on paper right now. So I, I think that, you know, the Falcons will be, you know, they're going to talk about Green Bay when this decision comes up of, well, look what happened there. You don't, you know, it, it looks like a wasted pick at this point. There's the, the, the off season maneuvering with the quarterbacks. It's been unlike any off season I've seen, and we just started, we're still the Super Bowl's yet to be played. And you've got, there's, you know, the Jared Goff, Matt Stafford deal. Then there's the chatter coming out of Philadelphia rumors about Carson Wentz's future. You know, there's, you know, obviously Deshaun Watson, if, you know, Matthew Stafford can command that hall, what does Deshaun Watson command? I mean, there's so many questions now. So that's, I guess, you know, in, in Matt Ryan isn't the issue here, but like you said, do you kind of have that, you, do you take the best player available 
And let me ask you this, since you are the draft expert here, you know, I think at one point you had six first round grades on quarterbacks. It, you know, you had Kyle Trask up there. Yeah. You, where are you now with the quarterbacks? And at number four, let's get right into it. Let's get right into the mock and let's get right into it, the Falcons here. What, you know, being at number four, it's a very attractive position. You have a lot of teams now. You have Carolina maybe looking. You Detroit's taking yeah. care of theirs. W you know, what does Philadelphia do? They go all line, DB, you know, uh, receiver. I mean, how do you think this plays out right now? Aside from the obvious one, Trevor Lawrence at number one. Yeah. Who, I know you, he's, I know he's what you think. First. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. He's going first. He's really, really good. Um, I, I think the, there are dominoes that have to fall to figure yeah. out exactly what's going to happen right now. I know that that's not the answer everyone wants, but you know, sitting here early February for the Super Bowl, it's what happens at number two, because the New York Jets have three options. They can keep Sam Darnold and draft someone to help him. They can keep Sam Darnold and trade the number two pick, or they can use the number two pick to draft a quarterback and trade Sam Darnold. So we really have to figure out what the Jets are going to do. And, They're the big actor, you know, with, right? With, yeah, right. And, and connected to that is what's going to happen with Deshaun Watson. Now, you know, that's a whole other gigantic question mark. But, you know, the Jets have been very connected to Deshaun Watson. Never, whether he wants to go there or not with his no trade clause is a, a separate separate conversation altogether but the Jets are the big domino because they could take a quarterback and then you have Miami at three uh, they they seem seemingly don't need a quarterback uh think a wide receiver comes off the board there and then you guys sitting at four so you know you could be looking at a QB three a wide receiver two tight end one on the board and they're all very good values now as far as the quarterback grades I have four with a true round one grade. Uh, okay. As you mentioned, I was at one point throwing six in the first round just because yeah. there are so many teams that need one. Uh, so Trevor Lawrence is a unicorn. He's great. Uh, we can move on. Zach Wilson at BYU, uh, Justin Fields at Ohio State, and Trey Lance from North Dakota State, I, I think are all tremendous prospects. In a year without a Trevor Lawrence, I think we would be talking about each of them as worthy of a number one overall selection. I wow. think, you know, okay. even compare them to a guy like, like Kyler Murray coming out. Like I, I like them more than I liked Kyler Murray, to be quite honest. And last year was a little different because Joe Burrow had had the best year a college quarterback has ever had. And that, that kind of changed some things, but yeah. you know, these four quarterbacks are all really, really talented to where, you know, if ownership in this new regime says, let's get a guy behind Matt Ryan and Justin Fields is sitting there and you have an opportunity to grab a quarterback who has the arm to make every throw uh, he's a very, very good athlete. He's a great leader. He's very intelligent. He just needs a little bit more coaching. He needs rounded out a little bit more. I mean, that's a dream scenario for a guy who, uh, you look at Justin Herbert and what he did for the Chargers this year. Oh. Justin Fields, like, they arguably has more raw talent, you know? Yeah. And so it's, okay, if you could have that guy and he just hangs out for a year or two and learns, that's a pretty good spot to be in Correct as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but didn't, Justin Herbert, I mean, he had been talked about, yeah, he's first round, first round, first round. And it just felt like the chatter leading up to the draft that he kind of was slipping a little bit for some reason. And Yeah, and that just, happens. Was, you yeah. almost get prospect fatigue yeah. where, you know, and I'll be honest, this happened to me. You know, for two years, I said, this guy's going to be QB1, this guy's going to be QB1. Yeah. And then you start, to, you start to overthink, like, well, he doesn't get off his first read very often. Or, you know, they really don't let him run a whole lot there. I wonder if he can do it. And you start to almost create questions because you've seen a player for so long. And that's where I think front offices have a great advantage because you can have another guy in the room being like, you're crazy. Uh, he's been good for years. Let's not overthink this, you right. know, where he's just really good. So I, I do think, you know, there was a little prospect fatigue. And then, you know, the rise of Joe Burrow uh, definitely changed some things too. Zach Wilson, you look at his body of work, he's, you know, people are saying, wow, he's really, you know, moving up the board. But if, when you look at what he's done for three years now, um, he, he's pretty impressive. And you talk about how quick he processes things and he's got the, he checks the boxes physically, you know, and he, um, he's, you know, we had 33 touchdowns and three picks and two of them were tip balls and one was a Hail Mary. I mean, right. And he, I guess the big knock on him is what the, the competition. Yeah, that's about it. I don't, he's not gonna be as big as he's listed. I think that's the, you know, he's probably gonna be oh. six one and not six okay. three, but okay. I don't even know if we care about that anymore. You know, like, is that as big of a deal as yeah. he used to? Right. You know, uh, Drew Brees did okay at six foot. So I, I think with Zach, you know, the only question will be level of competition and say, you know, he did struggle a little bit against Coastal Carolina. So you'll wanna, you know, you'll wanna check that box. My thing with like a, a Trey Lance at North Dakota State yeah, or Zach Wilson at BYU. Pandemic. Right. 
everyone will say to you level of competition and i i always fire back well what about his supporting cast because his supporting cast wasn't as good so when you say okay well he wasn't playing sec defenses wasn't well, playing with sec receivers either so you have to have the context right you got to have those things have to work together whereas mac jones at alabama no one played a tougher schedule at quarterback this year, but he did that with, you know, a first round receiver and Heisman trophy winner and Devonte Smith early in the year had Jalen Waddle. Oh, and last man. year he had four first round wide receivers and an offensive line full of NFLers. So which would you rather have a guy who's had to carry a program and maybe not play a, a super tough schedule or a guy who's been surrounded by great talent and played a tough schedule. There's, there's no right answer. That's yeah. what makes this job so hard is, Okay, I've seen Trey Lance and Zach Wilson win ball games by themselves. I love that trait in them, but I've never seen them do it against a Clemson or Ohio State or Alabama. So that there is like a, a catch twenty two to all these prospects. So a, a lot's going to change. We know that a lot's going to change in free agency. A lot's going to change. Uh, you know, as as some of these quarterbacks might may or may not be moved. Um, there's going to be stories that come out, just like recently the the story that was you know about micah parsons and i think that's actually an older story that's kind of taken on mm. legs again um if you you know i don't know what the gm of the jets is going to do it sounds like you know they may it, it, sam darnold was not his pick correct so let's yeah. just say that they they you know what they say let's 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 you know let, sam darnold can have a shot somewhere else and they move on and they take a quarterback and then to a, they either give him a receiver or a lineman. Um, what do you think? Who do you think is the best player? What on your big board, who is, who would be number four in that instance? If, if, uh, if the Falcons went best player available, best player available would be one of the offensive linemen. Um, the kid from Oregon I, or Slater yeah, from Northwestern. Right. Penny Sullivan, from Oregon or Rashawn Slater from Northwestern. Now, I think Falcons fans would probably uh, start throwing things at me if they took another offensive tackle in the first round. So um, so it becomes more of like a who's the best player at a position of need. And um, depending on what Miami did, you know, the, which wide receiver that is, it would be most likely Jamar Chase or Kyle Pitts, the tight end slash wide receiver. I don't I even know what the list. Kyle do you really Pitts go had. with need, though? I mean, do, do, you know, I always like to tell fans, you know, the Trailblazers <laughs> – Right, went for need. Michael Jordan, right? right? They went with right. me. I mean, I was actually having this conversation with somebody this morning, actually. Of oh, really? When you're drafting in the top, I mean, really, if, if when you're drafting in the top five, you should take the best player available because you're passing up on a great prospect, right? If you're a top five player, you're a great prospect. So, do you want to pass up on a great player uh, to fill a need that's like a what a 33 percent chance they hit in the first round? So. If I were drafting in the top five, maybe the top 10, you got to ignore need. You know, you're going to be drafting in what, pick 36 in round two. You get need there, you know, or fill needs with free agency. That's the, you know, I, I've heard Bill Belichick say that before. You know, we use free agency to fill needs, but fill, we, the draft, we're taking good players. So, you know, that's, I know the salary cap's a little bit of an issue right now, but, you know, that's, that's one of the keys. It's okay if you're at four, who's the best player? Because at the number four overall player in a draft should be an all pro. And so if you get that right, then would you rather have an all pro or would you rather check that box, you know, of so you whatever think that might be? You think that's Sewell or Slater? Uh, yeah. In that scenario, it would be. And, uh, or, or maybe, you know, this is where you get into things like, do you trade back, you know, uh, in that situation, but uh, you know, Sewell and Slater, whether, you know, they're both left tackles in my opinion, but you know, could they both be, all pros at guard yeah they could be but then you you get into a lot of questions off of this you know that's a very Falcons, expensive offensive line you know yeah. paying a, another lineman top five money is, is will be very expensive at some point so there's a lot of dynamics that go into play and i think the falcons are a unique team because at least in my opinion there's not one clear cut oh my god we have to fill it need and even if there were let's say an edge really? rusher it's like we got to get an edge rusher yeah. got to get an edge rusher yeah. well there's not one that you would draft it for just there's not there's no chase young this year there's no nick bosa the the top edge rusher on my that board was my next is question number 15 okay. number 15 overall and that's uh quitty pay from michigan from so, michigan okay yeah do you have him higher than the russo kid the, they're neck and neck it's okay. the edge class this year is interesting because like i said you know 15 is pay 16 is russo yeah. and then i want to say like 
20 is Jalen Phillips from Miami. Okay. There's a lot of guys grouped together uh, mid first round. And I, I think, you know, I have a mock draft that's coming out next week. They come off the board together in the twenties. It's just like you get to the Titans and these guys just start flying off the board. So, you know, but at four, that's a gigantic reach to take an edge rusher. So it's, again, you want to, I think in a perfect world, you try to fill your needs through you free agency. You don't think any good of the corners, you don't think Sertan or uh, Farley? I don't. For the I really don't. I, okay. No, I mean, Farley, like Farley, at, if we'd had a combine, he probably could have run well enough and people would be like, oh, okay. Like, there we go. That's, you know, that's a Jeff Akuda type player. Um, but him opting out this year and then no combine, there's a long time in between seeing this guy play football. Yeah. So I would be surprised if okay. either player, we don't see many corners go top five either. That's a, you know, I know Jeff Akuda went, you know, three last year, but historically yeah. corners don't go very early. Kind of had a rough year, um, but they had a lot of other issues too. Um, Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> I Hopefully. can say that. I don't know if you can. It's Detroit. <laughs> um let me just okay. So Matt Ryan's in, in the last three years, 42, 48, and 41. That's how many times he's been sacked. It's a lot. Mm-hmm. Now, some of that can be covered, some of that can be the quarterback, but that's a lot of sacks. Um, so even though Falcons fans may not like that pick, but if you're getting an all pro and he's gonna play 10 years and you can keep Matt Ryan upright, at least. If he's here, you know, another year, two years, three years, it's not a bad pick. Right. And it, I think we can look at teams. Uh, it hasn't resulted in a Super Bowl, but you know what Dallas did by building their offensive line. I think, you know, in Kansas City, uh, they have a number one overall pick in Eric Fisher, and they have a very high priced free agent in Mitchell Schwartz. Uh, I, they're both hurt right now, but, you know, when they were healthy, that's one of the best offensive uh, bookends in football. So, you know, the New Orleans Saints, they've invested uh, through free agency a little bit, but mostly through the draft and building their offensive line. So it, it would be, you know, I think two years after drafting Caleb McGarry, it might surprise people. But if, if you're just going best player available, yeah. it would be one of those offensive linemen. All right. Well, Let's talk about some of your drafts. Have you ever nailed, I mean, what's the closest that you've ever come in all the mock drafts? Have you ever gone back and just kind of graded yourself and just said, okay, this one, I was, I had 28, right? What's, (laughs) what's, what's been the best that you've done? And then has there ever been like a prospect where you just kind of stood on the mountaintop and you said, oh my gosh, this guy is going to be an all pro this and that what are they mm-hmm. doing and it was a whiff oh that definitely a lot of those i think so on the mock draft thing uh, i i will go back mostly just to see <laughs> mock drafts are, are what you hear right I mean, mock yep. drafts are predictions you take all the information and, and you predict so i will go back and see like who lied to me like who just straight up <laughs> lied to me and used me and led me astray so i will go back and do that as far as like uh, like grading them, like report card style, I, I don't do that. I know there are some places that do. Okay. Uh, last year, I think I did pretty well because it, it was somewhat predictable. So I don't want to give myself a lot of credit. But I, I think yeah. last year, you know, I think I had Tua and Herbert flipped. And I, I think I had uh, Derek Brown and Simmons flipped. But I think otherwise in the top 20, it was pretty, pretty close. So um but don't hold me to that. That standard is impossible. It's like March Madness. No one's brackets <laughs> perfect, right? Um, now, as far as guys that I've you know jumped up on the table and said they're going to be all pros, it's usually the opposite. Actually, it's usually the other way around, where you are like, this guy's not good. He's going to be a bum. You know, Derrick Henry's the most uh, famous one right now. So um, I think of a guy who I watched at Alabama and just thought this is not this is not what the NFL is going to. The NFL at that time, you know, it was all these smaller guys speed plays let's get outside the tackle box you got to be able to catch and just could you know i didn't see someone saying we're going to go back to like 1995 and just run the ball down your throats it you know and like it's in hindsight it's so predictable of defenses are getting smaller people are in nickel coverage 70 percent of the time let's just run the ball down their throats at these 220 pound linebackers it, right, you were, you were feeling pretty good about it. Henry there for a little while, right? I mean, oh, like, yeah. oh, the first year and a half, I was like, I'm right. <laughs> you guys don't know what you're talking about. And then Enter it was Arthur like, Smith. Oh, yeah. man, 
Yeah. And, you know, Mike Vrabel and Arthur Smith yeah, should have known. Done what, a heck of a job, yeah. yeah. Like when Vrabel got hired, it was like, great. This is going to be smashing out football and I'm going to be wrong. So Derrick Henry was one that I was, oh, just gigantic whiff. You know, it was like, man, this guy's going to be a short yardage back. <laughs> Might want to play fullback. But it, still, though, <laughs> no, Derrick Henry's great. I think he's the best running back in football over the last two years. I, well, all, every time I watch him, I'm like, how do people not even try to tackle him? Which is easy for me to say at home when he's not running at me. But Derrick Henry's ability to run away from defenses is, is the most confusing thing in the world to me. Uh, because he's like, he is fast, but he's not, he's not that fast, right? But he's, he's phenomenal for sure. So I know your last mock for the Falcons, you had Micah Parsons going up there. Do you think he falls? I do. Um, okay. I, like you said, there's a story out there of, um, you know, some hazing uh, you yep. know, issues at Penn State, some, you know, immaturity. Uh, I, I think that's it, it. Like you said, it's an old story. This is not new information. Um, yep. I have not heard a team yet say like, hey, we're going to, this is going to drop him out of the first round. It's nothing like that. But also teams haven't interviewed him yet because yeah. of, yeah. because of COVID. And so I think that will be something that we learn a little bit later. Um, I, I think he's still drafted in the top 20, but as far as being a top five pick, uh, probably not anymore. Okay. Um, and if you had to just kind of, what do you think the chances are the Falcons at this point? I, I'm just putting you on the spot here because it's fun. Uh, take a quarterback. <laughs> uh, so I will, I'll, te- I'll go and tell you, I, I, like I said, I have a seven round mock draft coming out next week. I do not have the Falcons taking a quarterback. February 11th, right? February 11th, seven okay. rounds, no quarterback in round one for the Falcons. Well, let's merge, let's merge that final thought. I want to just get your take on what you think the Falcons future is, is going to shape up. Like, you know, the, the fans here, it's been three non-playoff years, seven and nine, yeah. seven and nine, four wins uh, since the Super Bowl. Um, you know, Dan Quinn, you know, was beloved here. It just didn't work out. And so now they've got this new regime who really, you know, Terry's saying all the right things. He's like, you know, what? I'm not afraid to draft strength on strength. And Arthur's yeah. saying, you know what, we're going to be accountable. Everyone's accountable, but you know what, we're going to adapt to what we have. And so, and I'm going to put guys in a position, he's going to be a play caller too, but he's going to put guys in a position that he believes is, gives them the best chance to succeed. So you, they're going to be adept. There, there's no, and then you got Dean Pease, the defensive coordinator who, you know, got, he, he made a great impression, his first uh, presser. And he, he basically just said, look at, you know, we're going to be, multiple up front and simple on the back end and we don't when people ask you four three three four he says yep so the know, baltimore philosophy yeah hybrid we're just yeah hybrid. that's where he, yeah. he came from baltimore at one point yeah. so yeah so what what do you think they ultimately do and what do you think that you know what, what what's your feeling i know you said it's a home run higher but what do you think this team looks like moving forward Yeah, I think the biggest thing I would expect offensively for them to take some of the pressure off Matt. You know, I think that's a big reason that Arthur was hired was Matt Ryan does not need developed, but you need a scheme that takes pressure off him. And like you said, those getting sacked 40 plus times can't happen. So whether that's more play action, uh, quicker route combinations, more uh, power run, I would, that's what I'm expecting more of just the Tennessee offense, you know, is just get the ball out quickly. Uh, Ryan Tannehill has not turned the ball over a lot there because there there's a lot of throws that are, not gimme throws, but they're allowing him to you know quickly find his read, get the ball out, and and they're what I would consider you know low risk type throws. And so I, I look for that. And again, mm-hmm. the run game is huge here. So the, and that should help uh, you know the offensive line. Every offensive lineman's happier when they're moving the ball forward instead of instead of going backwards. So I, I look at that. Um, I, I do think, like you've said, when I look at what Terry Fontenot brings to this team is again the pro and college scouting experience, but you know being part of an organization that. They don't. They haven't missed very much in, in New Orleans when it comes to draft picks, and they've done that by uh, forecasting. You know, they're sometimes drafting two to three years ahead, but they've hit on that. You know, go back to the 2017 draft class is one of the greatest ever because their ability to say and they, 2017 is one of the greatest draft classes ever, and they didn't get Patrick Mahomes. They missed him by one pick. Think about that. So it's still one of the greatest. So I think just their the, the style of player that they identify, and then we've seen you know, in, in other years where they identify a guy in Marcus Davenport. Okay, let's go get him. So they can be aggressive if That's need right, be, yeah, but know. I think they stack their board exceptionally well. And so I think just that strategy, you know, you're going from a little bit of a, a different group, you know, from 
uh, Dimitrov being more of a Bill Belichick disciple and that line of thinking to now you've got this Sean Payton, you know, Mickey Loomis type front office that's going to be run here. So I think you'll see a big difference there. Now, I, I know, you know, if I were ever interviewed for a job, you got to walk in there and say, it's, this is how many years it's going to take to be competitive. And I think for Atlanta, the key is because you have Matt Ryan and Julio Jones, you should be competitive this year. You, you have to be competitive year one. How long will it take to make this team a competitor? Uh, because of the salary cap, I mean, what, year two, year three? Um, and, and then the question is, how much longer does Matt want to play? So I think the first question that you got to check off the box is, is asking Matt, how long do you want to play? Are, are you trying to play till you're 40 or, or longer? Uh, that seems to be the benchmark these days because if, if he's, yeah. you know, he's been hit, like you said, uh, 120 times the past three years he's been sacked. If that's taking its toll and he's starting to think about, yeah, I'm getting a little older, want to do some other things, then you have to take the quarterback. Because that's the thing as long with as Matt, Matt Ryan's there. Yeah. He's, he's, he's been healthy. I mean, he is right. not the, the one little thing, what, two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's missed what three games. Yeah. So, you know, he's, no, been, remarkable. Re- he's yeah. been really durable. Right. So. No, absolutely. But I, I do think the question is if, if he's, if, if there's a doubt or excuse me, if there's a chance he could retire in the next four years, you have yeah. to take the quarterback. And my, my reasoning behind that would really? be really with, okay. with Matt, okay. with Matt Ryan as your quarterback, you're not going to be drafting the top five again. Right. I mean, it's just, you're, he's too good. Um, and I think the staff is too good. So if he's out over the course of somebody's rookie contract, then, then I would pull the trigger on a quarterback there. But as I said, I don't have them doing that. Yeah. Because- so let's segue into your February 11th and your, your budding empire here. So, right. I mean, you've got the NFL draft scout, tell us, just go through it and just t- tell us, cause I know you've got this product, you've got you know, you've got your YouTube channel. Um, what, yeah. what do draft Knicks get when they subscribe and what are you giving them? Yeah. Trying to give them everything, to be honest. Like you said, the draft scout is already up. You can go there today. There's some you know pieces that I've been able to put up as previews, but it, yep. it fully launches February 11th with a seven round mock draft, uh, followed very quickly by a top 300 big board. And then my scouting notebook column will be coming back, which is all the like news and rumors that I hear from around the league, as well as just, you know, thoughts on, on the off season. So that'll all be launching. Uh, February 11th. Uh, but right now, people are getting, you know, we're doing virtual happy hours, scouting clinics. We did a live mock draft the other night where 32 general managers got to run their team, right? So a Falcons fan got to come on the clock at four. Okay. You just got to make the pick. Fan. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, they make the pick. Well, there were trades. I mean, this thing was crazy, but, you know, there's a clock. They had three minutes to make their, like make their move. Fun, and so yeah. it was a great time. I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, but as you said, in this day and age, you have to diversify. So you can't just write, obviously. So there's the articles and everything yeah. that will live on the draftscout.com. Uh, I do a, a radio show every day from two to four, which people can stream anywhere in the world. It's called Mic'd Up, uh, based in Joplin, Missouri. And so that's just my chance to like, be a baseball fan, you know? So and, how many, and how many, how many mock drafts and how many pieces, like, how many pieces you put in, putting up, uh, you know, give or take a, a day or, or a week? Yeah, so my goal on the written side is three articles a week, okay. and then a radio show every day, uh, okay. two podcasts a week, Monday morning, Friday morning. It's called Two Guys, a Girl, and a Podcast, and yeah. it's it's NFL, NFL draft, college football, with a little bit of, you know, humor and tailgating and things like that on the side. Where can they find all this, Matt? The easiest way to find everything is just go to Twitter and follow me at NFL Draft Scout. There's a link in the bio. You click it and it'll show, you know, okay, here's a link to the website. Here's a link to the radio show. Here's a link to the YouTube, the podcast, everything. Because everything like you there. said, it's, you know, it's not, I don't just work one place anymore where you could go to Bleach Report and hope to find everything that I was doing. Yeah. I will yeah. say this is much easier because even my friends and family would be like, I'd drop a mock draft and be like, where's your mock draft? Like, oh, it's in the Bleach Report app. You'd be like, where? I have no idea where now, anytime I write an article, if you're a subscriber, it goes right to your email inbox. So as soon as I hit publish, you don't have to like the whole article goes to your inbox. You don't have to like click a link. You open the email, boom, there's the article. Delivered so right to your trying phone. to simplify it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's smart, man. Um, this is, this is good stuff. Uh, how's, how's it going so far? You got a lot of people uh, signing up or what? Yeah, I've been pretty transparent about it. Uh, we've got around 9,000 people signed up. Uh, not all wow. 9,000 are paying, of course. Uh, I'm not making that kind of money, guys. Settle down. Not but 9,000 people uh, have signed up to get the you know, the articles that are free and, and keep updated on what's happening. So uh, spread the word because I've been doing giveaways like crazy too, like giving away hoodies like the one I'm wearing, uh, giving away signed helmets, Madden copies. Like I want this to be fun. I want to 
incentivized because like I said, I don't, I don't think charging people seven bucks a month just to read my work is worth it. I, I'm not that good of a writer. Let's be honest. So I want to have fun with it. I want it to be a community thing. I mean, if you think I am, that's great. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, but no, I want it. I want it to be fun. I do. I want it to be a community. Um, I have a love hate relationship with Twitter. So more, the more I can get off Twitter to talk to draft fans, I'm going to do that. So we actually started with a you. discord server. So there's like 700 people in this discord server all day talking about the draft and you know, we have rules, no politics, no religion, no trolling, you know, we're just, like just having fun with it. I love it. Well, well, I'm going to have to dive into uh, some of the stuff and, uh, and get my hands on some, uh, some merch. I love that hoodie, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, I, they've been count, popular so far. Count me up for signing up. I'm going to do that right after this show. Um, I am a big fan of yours as, as you know, and, uh, you know, I think eventually, you know, you're going to put Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay out of business, hopefully. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'd but, be okay uh, joining them. You know, that uh, here's the, thing. uh, Mel is my icon. He's the reason yeah. I have a job. You know, he started this industry. Yeah, so. I know. He's a, uh, I actually legend. never met him though. So really, yeah. Like, you know, I've met McShay a couple of times. Super, super great guy. Yeah, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, yeah. you know, like I consider them you know, guys I look up to and like, it's cool yeah. that they've given me their phone number. So when I meet Mel Kiber, I'll probably faint. <laughs> That's a fan me. You know, yeah, he's still got, he's still got the, the pompadour going. I know. Right. Oh, so he's got it right here. <laughs> well, Matt, Hey, I really appreciate you coming on and I want to do it again as we get closer to the draft. And I would definitely love to have you come on uh, to just talk about, you know, everything you're doing, how's it going, but also just get your reactions to what the Falcons ultimately end up doing in free agency and the draft and uh as this thing kind of progresses and builds this roster comes together it's always fun talking to people like you that actually know what they're talking about and uh i really really appreciate it you've been great and uh, i wish you the best of luck with the uh, nfl draft scout too um, yeah thank so you hopefully people sign up for that i appreciate it and yeah i'm, I'm happy to come on anytime i i actually find myself with a lot more free time and i'm my own boss so if you Hit me up awesome. like, hey, want to do a podcast? Yeah, sure. Sounds great. Awesome. Matt, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you, guys.